On November 8th of 1895, a man named Wilhelm Röntgen turned on a covered vacuum tube and accidentally discovered the x-ray and changed our world. This is not that story. Instead, this is the story of why Röntgen was playing with a covered tube in the first place. Why would someone cover the tube? What does that have to do with the creation and the discovery of x-rays? And how was the x-ray machine invented in the first place? Ready for the story? Let's go. Electricity, electricity. I'm going to start in 1882. That's when a 24-year-old German scientist named Heinrich Hertz wrote his parents, quote, I am busy from morn till night with optical phenomenon in rarefied gases. Hertz, like almost all of the scientific community, was inspired by the experiments and conclusions of a charismatic English chemist named William Crookes. Four years earlier, Crookes demonstrated that if he applied a high voltage across a glass tube with a high vacuum or through a gas that was rarefied, an invisible cathode ray would emanate from the negative electrode and make glass on the other end glow. He wasn't the first to do this, but due to some clever experiments, he was the first to think that this was a ray of charged atoms. This was a radical idea, and soon everyone was playing with Crookes tubes. Hertz found that although the cathode ray would bend with a magnetic field, it would not move with an electric field, and Hertz decided that cathode rays were a type of ultraviolet light, concluding that, quote, cathode rays have no closer relation to electricity than has the light produced by an electric lamp. By the way, Hertz didn't realize that trace amounts of gases were insulating the cathode ray from the electric field. And years later, J.J. Thompson figured that out and then demonstrated that these rays are not ultraviolet light or charged atoms, but actually charged subatomic particles called electrons. Hertz then moved from electrifying tubes to electrifying an antenna which is how, in 1886, he discovered the radio wave. By the way, radio is an invisible electromagnetic wave that has no closer relation to electricity than the light produced by an electric lamp. Crazy, huh? In December of 1890, Hertz went to England to receive the Rumford Medal for his work on radio waves. While in England, he met Crookes. Perhaps for that reason, Hertz went back to studying cathode rays. This time, he was interested in the power and the heat from the cathode rays. Now, in 1879, Crookes had melted a piece of platinum foil by placing the foil in the middle of the tube and focusing the cathode ray on it. Hertz, however, used an unfocused cathode ray, put the foil at the end of the tube against the glass, and used gold as it was easier to melt. To his surprise, the gold didn't melt, and it also didn't block the path of the cathode rays. He said that the gold leaf, quote, looks like a faint veil upon the glass plate, chiefly recognizable at its edges and by the slight wrinkles in it. This seemed to validate his theory, the cathode rays were really waves, as he thought particles couldn't make it through a solid without breaking it. He was wrong. Anyway, he tried it on a multitude of different metals and found they all worked, but he thought aluminum worked the best because it was so easy to use. Tragically, mere months after this publication, Hertz started having severe headaches, quit researching. He died on January 1st of 1894 when he was just 36 years old from blood poisoning. Before Hertz gave up on research, he called his assistant, Philip Leonard, and said, quote, we ought to separate two chambers with aluminum leaf and produce the rays as usual in one of the chambers and observe the rays in the other chamber. Now, Leonard had been fascinated with cathode rays ever since he'd read about Crookes' experiments. And also, years before, he'd read Hertz's old paper that said that cathode rays were a form of ultraviolet light. And he had an ingenious idea. Leonard knew that quartz crystals transmit ultraviolet light. So Leonard made a tube with a quartz window to let the cathode rays out of the tube and into the air. Unfortunately for Leonard, cathode rays are not ultraviolet light, so that didn't work. However, after talking to Hertz, Leonard now knew of an object that would transmit cathode rays, aluminum. Leonard recalled, he took out, quote, the old tube again, replaced the quartz with a metal plate containing a small hole, sealed with aluminum foil, spread a few grains, of phosphor on the small aluminum window, excited the tube, 
and lo and behold, the grains glowed brightly. The cathode rays had escaped the tube. And even more surprisingly, and Leonard said no one could have predicted this, they not only could escape the tube, they could travel a few inches in air. Leonard was ecstatic. It was, quote, a breakthrough into the unknown. Leonard didn't know it, but he just made an X-ray machine that was perfectly suited to discover the X-ray. Years later, he complained, quote, all Runkin had to do was push a button since all the groundwork had been prepared by me. Now you should know that Leonard's tube was actually not very good at making X-rays. And the Crookes tube where he melted platinum with a focus cathode ray was a far better X-ray machine. However, as Crookes was busy studying the platinum, he never realized what he was creating. He even accidentally developed some of his photographic plates with his X-ray machine but he just thought the plates were defective and returned them to the manufacturer. Over the years, several other people accidentally took x-ray pictures with vacuum tubes, notably Arthur Goodspeed in 1890, Fernando Sanford in 1891, and Nikola Tesla in 1894, although none of them realized exactly what they were looking at. What made Leonard's tube so perfect for discovering the x-ray is that it was the first one you study from the outside. Inside the tube, it is very hard to distinguish between the lights from the cathode ray and from the lights from the x-rays. Outside Leonard's tube, the only thing that was supposed to emanate were cathode rays through the aluminum window, and they only travel a couple of inches in air. Therefore, all you needed to discover the x-ray was a covered Leonard tube in a dark room, good vision, an appropriate fluorescent screen, and the luck to notice a glow a few feet away from the tube. If you're wondering why Leonard didn't notice x-rays, it was because he was using a fluorescent screen made of light elements that was basically transparent to x-rays, although it worked fine on cathode rays. And Röntgen happened to be using one that was equally as efficient for cathode rays, but about a hundred times more efficient for detecting x-rays. So how did Leonard's tube make x-rays? And why was the old Crookes tube where he melted platinum superior? In both Leonard's and Crookes tubes, X-rays are made when a beam of fast-moving electrons hits the solid. The quick-moving electrons were created when a high voltage was placed across the vacuum tube, and the negative electrons on or near the cathode are repelled from the negative side and speed towards the other side. When electrons hit a solid, they can create X-rays in two ways. First, electrons can be diverted by the nucleus of the atom, and as they whip around the atom, they lose energy and produce X-ray. This is called Bremsstrahlung for breaking radiation. If the atom is light, meaning having few protons like aluminum, then it produces less breaking, so it produces less breaking radiation. But if the atom is heavy like platinum, it creates more breaking radiation. Second, the incoming electron can actually knock out a low energy electron. When this happens, an energy in a higher shell falls down to fill in the empty spot and releases that change in energy as an X-ray. This is called X-ray fluorescence. This produces more powerful X-rays. However, with light elements, these X-rays are often not emitted as they tend to be reabsorbed by the same atom to make it release another electron instead, called the Auger electron. In conclusion, aluminum makes less powerful Bremsstrahlung X-rays and almost no fluorescence X-rays. This is why X-rays were first discovered with a covered Leonard's tube, but Crookes platinum tubes were quickly found to make more X-rays and were used for X-ray machines for the next 20 years or so. It's easy to dismiss Leonard's contributions because he turned into this big Nazi and pain in both Röntgen's and Einstein's side but he really did have an important role to play in the history of x-rays and in physics in general. This is not in any way to diminish what Röntgen accomplished. For Röntgen didn't just notice x-rays, but by himself and with primitive equipment and over a course of just weeks, he found them, named them, decided that they were electromagnetic waves, that they came from the cathode ray hitting the wall, that they were blocked by lead, that their penetrating power depended on the density of the material, and even took the first medical x-ray of his wife's hand. Once Runkin took that first medical x-ray, according to him, all hell broke loose. And that story is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Let's
Electricity, electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't seen it already and you're interested in how Hertz discovered radio waves, I have a video about that. And also make sure to check out the next one about Runkin. He's an interesting cat. Okay, have a good day.